Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Stelter, president here at the Stelter Company, and uh, thank you as always for joining our webinar today. It's a great one around navigating gift agreements, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, presented by uh, Meg Klein, who's the uh, vice president for gift planning and trust services at the University of Illinois Foundation. Uh, I'll get back to introducing Meg in just a couple minutes, but I'd first like to say a few words about Stelter's webinar series. Uh, as Stelter, as an expert advocate for asset-based giving, uh, we're committed to providing innovative solutions and education for the uh, nonprofit industry. We pride ourselves on being a bridge builder for the community and are happy to host this free webinar today, connecting you to experts like Meg from across the country to assist you in maximizing revenue across your development portfolio. Uh, today's webinar is actually our sixth of our 2024 webinar series, and we still have a few more scheduled for this year. Uh, up next will be a terrific panel discussion uh, led by John Kendrick, uh, who's gift planning and impact philanthropy consultant, uh, who has more than 20 years of experience, uh, uh, largely with George Washington University. And John will be leading a discussion on the con uh, conception, creation, and execution of plan giving legacy challenges uh, with colleagues Kara Barnes, who's uh, the Senior Gift Planning Officer at the Smithsonian, uh, Kent Daly, Director of Plan Giving at Episcopal High School in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and then John Jensen, uh, Plan Giving Director at Washington National Cathedral. So that'll be a great discussion around a variety of organizations and how they've navigated legacy challenges. So keep an eye out for your personal invitations in your inbox uh, as the webinar gets closer. And if you missed any of the previous webinars uh, or interested in uh, signing up for future ones, you can always view and access uh, those uh, recordings uh, on our website at uh, stelter.com backslash webinars. Uh, now back to today's webinar, uh, again, with our presenter, Meg Klein. Uh, Meg serves, as I mentioned, the, as the Vice President for Gift Planning and Trust Services at the University of Illinois Foundation, uh, where she's responsible for the team of professional staff that oversees all aspects of gift planning, deferred gift administration, and all gift documentation for the University of Illinois system and its three universities. Uh, prior to this role, Meg served for five years as the Associate Dean for, for Advancement for the College of Agriculture, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Al Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, before that, Meg worked for the Missouri State Employees Retirement System in Jefferson City, Missouri, where she assisted in the management of institutional investment portfolios. Uh, however, she started her fundraising career at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And prior to this time, she worked in the fee-only financial planning industry as a financial advisor. Meg received a Bachelor of Science degree and MBA from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, past president and member of the board of directors of the uh, terrific Chicago Council on Plan Giving, uh, the National Association of Carol, uh, Charitable Gift Planners, and the Eastern Illinois Estate Planning Council. Meg has been very busy. Uh, we're excited to have Meg. We were just chatting about the Big Ten, and uh, I'm, a, as we all know, a big Hawkeye fan, and she's Illinois, and now we have four new schools, and we're like the Big 18. So, uh, we, instead of talking football and college athletics today, we're going to talk uh, everything around gift agreements. So I will hand it over to Meg. Thank you so much, Nathan. And a big thank you to you and Jen for having me today. It's always nice when a Hawkeye invites an Illini to present. So uh, we're, we're all good friends in the Big Ten, for sure. Um, well, again, thank you for having me. I hope today's session will be informative for all on the call and reviewing the list of participants. It looks like we've got a wide breadth of organizations joining us from large organizations to small organizations. And I think it's fair to say when it comes to gift agreements, there is no one size fits all, but I think there are some key elements that make for a really good gift agreement. And we're gonna hopefully highlight those today. And I'm gonna talk about some case studies and real examples. And we'll even have a little polling a little later here to see you know, what would we say yes to and what would we not say yes to um, in a gift agreement. So with that, I'm gonna get us started here. And of course, you know, I my day job is I work for the University of Illinois Foundation. Um, and it's the best job in the world, as I tell people, that I get to work with loyal and committed donors and friends who want to do good things for higher education. But of course, everything I share here today is really Meg's thoughts. It's sharing some of the things we do here at the University of Illinois Foundation. But as always, we would encourage you to talk to your own legal counsel um, about gift agreements, because certainly different states have different rules in different ways of um, doing things, and so it's important that you consult with your your advisors. So 
with the reference to attorneys, I think it's always good to start with a little levity in these conversations. And that is, um, you know, your, your proposal is written with clarity and conviction. Send it up to legal for obfuscation. I, I think that is so true in a lot of gift agreements that I have seen. And I think sometimes as fundraisers, if you're a fundraiser on this call, it's finding the right balance between being clear in capturing what the donor wants to achieve and that impact and that that warm fuzzy this is the impact they're going to have and then also dotting the i's and crossing the t's with legal terms and um, perspectives that you might want to have in a gift agreement to set expectations um, going forward so why why is um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about what are gift agreements and why are they so important and we'll we'll get to that in just a minute, but we're going to start by oftentimes talking about what a gift agreement is not. I think that's the most important thing is to realize what really you don't want to achieve in a gift agreement, because I think sometimes and I will I will go back to when I first started in this business and came to the University of Illinois Foundation. I, I had the privilege of working for Bill Sturdivant. And I remember back in the day as gift planners, we wrote all the gift agreements. And we would have a lot of major gift officers ask for a gift agreement and use it like a proposal. And so we were writing gift agreements right and left sometimes as a proposal to donors. And it was a, a huge waste of time and energy and resources. And I'll, I'll get more into that, but I think all of us in organizations have found times where sometimes it's easy to hit the easy button and say, oh, I'm just going to put that gift agreement in front of them. And I would say that the gift agreement comes later. It's after the proposal. It's after the conversations with the donor. We're going to talk a little bit about what what, a, what is the purpose of a gift of gift documentation. It may not always be a tangible gift agreement, depending on the type of asset that's being given and the structure of the gift. And I'll talk more about that. What are some key elements that you might want to think about? And then I will share just a, a rough high level outline of really key sections you might want to think about having in your overarching uh, gift agreements um, for posterity. And I see we've even already got questions in the Q&A that I will get to some of those along, along the line, that line. And I see that there are some questions coming into the chat as well and i'm going to close my chat here so that um i can disregard that but yes please do put your questions in the q a i will try to answer those as we go along but my goal is to be wrapped up here no later than 12 45 so we have plenty of time for questions all right so i alluded to this um before but what in my view um Gift agreements are the starting point for effective donor stewardship, okay? Um, as I mentioned earlier, gift agreements are, are not the proposal to a donor to inspire them to give. Uh, a gift agreement is not a substitute for donor relations. Unfortunately, we just don't ink the fund agreement or the gift agreement and then say, oh, we're done with you now, moving on to the next donor. There's, there's more that has to happen after that gift agreement is signed. It's not gift administration. Yes, the gift agreement is going to set the parameters for which we administer that gift, but there's actual ongoing monitoring and work that needs to be done utilizing the gift agreement as a tool in effective gift administration. And last, but certainly not least, it's not always how you book a gift. And I think any of you who work in large organizations where maybe gift planning or gift agreements is separate from the um, fundraising you know, application know that, hey, if a, if a fundraiser comes back and we've got a signed gift agreement with a donor, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is in place, particularly if it's an estate gift. You know, Has the donor done everything in their estate um, documents to ensure that we will in fact actually receive that gift. So we'll, we'll dig a little deeper in these topics, but I think this is a good slide to just capture and remind ourselves that if your organization 
is using gift agreements in any of these ways, you probably have some opportunities for growth and improvement in some of your practices. So let's talk about proposals. Again, I mentioned early in my career, we would have fundraisers that were notorious for saying, I need a, I need a gift agreement for a scholarship to the English department. And inevitably, if you ask the question, like, well, have you talked to the donor about making a gift of, uh, to the English department for a scholarship. And sometimes they'd say, no, no, I just wanna get something in front of them to start thinking about it. Well, you don't need a gift agreement to do that. Um, and so we've really pushed back on that here that um, if a donor, if a fundraiser wants a gift agreement, we ask the question, have you developed the proposal yet? What was the proposal that you put in front of them? What are the terms? Because we wanna make sure that we're crafting gift agreements that have already uh, had a proposal put in front of them that outlined the terms and inspire impact. It, it, our gift agreements are not all that inspiring. And I, I am very fortunate here. I've got a great team of professionals. Jenny Carroll leads that team. Uh, Kale Brinketter is part of that team that draft all of our gift agreements. But I think even they would agree they're not, there's not a lot of sizzle in our gift agreements. They look like legal documents. They, they're pretty black and white in terms of these are the terms. Um, it doesn't inspire investment. Um, it really is articulating on paper what you and the donors have agreed, agreed to. So we'll talk a little more about that, but moving to our next slide here. So let's talk a little bit about proposals. And um, I hope your organization has given some thought to a proposal template. I know um, University of Illinois, we're a big place. And I know every college and unit here has different proposals that they use. But I think um, regardless of the size of your organization, I think there is an opportunity for you to make sure that any proposal that you draft to donors have these, these core elements. And I, and I am not the marketer. And unfortunately, if you're Stelter clients, you've got marketing partners um, that you can work with to get the right language to really inspire that opportunity to invest in your organization. But number one, it has to be donor centric. It can't look like it was canned. It has to look like a personalized approach, particularly if it's a gift of, of size and scope. Um, it engages that donor both intellectually and in the difference that that gift can make, but also emotionally. Um, number two, how does that gift in the proposal leverage current resources? Um, we, are, we are always very cautious. We're not gonna put in gift agreements, discussions about how we're leveraging resources to do something. We put that in the proposal. This gift will help us leverage this investment or that investment as the organ as the organization. Um, how does it complement existing funds? I think we all know of situations where um, maybe our organization has accepted a gift where it's not the gift that keeps on giving, it's the gift that keeps on eating. And I think you have to be very cautious that proposals you are drafting really are funded at a level that is enough and useful enough that they aren't a drain on your um, organization's resources, but they actually add value to the bottom line for your organization. Um, visual appeal. I, I think, honestly, proposals need to be clear and concise. They need to have a lot of white space. Um, I think gift agreements have some of that element. I mean, while our gift agreements are a, um, you know, a legal document, they're, they do have good spacing and clear structures and are very consistent. And then last but not least, shows the impact, not the need. And that's that's fundraising one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody gives to the you know sinking ship. They want to know that they are giving to an organization that is solid, um, has financial resources to fulfill that in that mission that you are striving to achieve. It's relevant to them, it's compelling, it drives them to make action. And it, it unifies by saying to the donor, join us in this crusade to achieve this end result. 
The other part of gift agreements is, as I mentioned, gift agreements are not the warm fuzzy. They are not the donor relationship. They're important. They're important, an important element of setting expectations about um, a fund and the use of the funds. But I often think sometimes that people think, oh, we're going to have a, a gift agreement signing party. Well, well, maybe you want to have a gift agreement signing party. I'm not saying that's bad donor relations. But at the end of the day, if that's all you're doing is signing a gift agreement, you're, you're probably not going to get additional gifts or contributions um, to that fund. And again, I'm not going to belabor this in light of time, but here are some key elements of effective donor relations. I mean, good donor relations, we want to further that relationship at the time of the gift and beyond, particularly if it's an estate gift. You know, you're just getting started when you sign a gift agreement that's being funded through a bequest intention. There's a long road ahead of you, hopefully, of years of building donor relationships and cultivation to see that deferred gift come to fruition. Um, secondly, it is, you know, you want to immediately celebrate that commitment, but you also might want to have a stewardship plan um, outside of the gift agreement. We do that a lot. Sometimes donors have clear expectations of what they want in the stewardship and the relationship with the donor or, or with the unit. Um, we've had donors say to us, oh, I would like for the gift agreement to say, we're going to annually do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. We tend to push back on that here. We, we, we say to units, hey, why don't you kind of craft a plan for what stewardship a donor can expect for a gift of that size and that magnitude and talk about that one off, but we don't want to put it in a, a long-term, you know, legal, legal document. We want that to be a, a separate conversation because we know that what one dean or one unit head commits to today may not be practical or feasible 10, 15, 20 years. We say that's a living, breathing document that should change more than what the gift agreement actually changes. And then, of course, a promise of future outreach. You know, impact reports are so important to donors who make gifts, even gifts that have not yet been realized. I know our College of Engineering here has done a really good job of identifying all of their um, estate donors. And if they're giving to a scholarship fund, they get an impact report tailored specifically to them about this, the impact of scholarships and thanking them for their future commitment to support scholarships. They do the same thing for faculty and then they do another category for kind of everything else, research, unrestricted, capital projects, et cetera. Um, and so again, I think this is obvious and to keep our focus on uh, gift agreements, let's keep going. Uh, a gift agreement is not gift administration. Um, Gift administration, we are fortunate here to have a significant and large gift administration team that works closely with our colleges and units and their the finance office. So any of you on the call who happen to be from finance offices, this is where you come in. You want to make sure that that gift agreement has certain elements in it that allow you to effectively administer that gift and allows you enough flexibility to administer that gift over time. So as gift administration, at least here at the University of Illinois, they are constantly looking to ensure that we are following the donor's intent. And so in our gift agreements, you will see a statement of donor intent and, and use. Um, we also recognize that when we, when we set up a gift agreement, that's static. It's static. We try to, I, I'm a farm girl. I like to say, how do we build uh, big fences and pasture so that we have um, lots of flexibility on the use of that fund that really gets to donor intent, but doesn't pigeonhole us in such a narrow framework that we can't effectively use that gift for the long term, particularly if it's uh, an endowment or particularly if it's something that's going to be funded with a bequest. Um, I think it's important with bequest gifts, you may have a gift agreement, but before you ever receive that gift, that gift agreement, while it is static and permanent, it may change a little bit over the life of that donor to be tailored to what those current needs are as you get closer to the maturity of that gift. Um, 
I think one other thing, and I'm not going to read all my slides here to you, but is stewardship. You know, the difference, the gift agreement is static, the stewardship is dynamic. And that's where I think it's important for us in um, crafting these that we, we separate what is a static function that could be captured in a gift agreement and what is dynamic and ongoing that needs to be um, conveyed more maybe between a unit and the donor or individually in a letter between the organization and the donor and not necessarily in a formal gift agreement. And last but not least, as I said, gift agreements are not how you quote book or record a gift. Um, we, we go over this a lot with our, our frontline fundraisers that when a donor, when a donor signs a fund agreement, we generally include a section on the statement of gifts. So I know uh, Don, you've got a question in the chat about a donor making a gift of Bitcoin, that's great. We've, we've accepted Bitcoin for a while. Um, whether or not they're giving us a gift of Bitcoin is not gonna be the driver for when we need a gift agreement. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I do think it's important that right up front in the gift agreement, we have a statement of gift and we try to identify what is the donor giving us? If the donor is making a gift of Bitcoin, we, we will say that the donor intends to make a gift of Bitcoin of X, X dollars worth an appraised value of this. We will state explicitly what is being given in that in that um, gift and in that intention. Um, but if they say they're giving it and it's not a pledge, we're not going to actually book that gift or record that gift until we actually receive that gift. Um, same is true for deferred gifts. If somebody says that you know they've made an estate provision to the University of Illinois Foundation for scholarships in the English department, we are not going to record that gift based on that statement in the gift agreement. We're going to go one step further, and that's a whole nother presentation, uh, but we're going to ask for the underlying um, estate documentation. Is it a beneficiary designation in an IRA? We're going we're gonna to ask a few more questions about is it a annuity and life income gift that they've established with us? We're gonna we're gonna state what they're giving, but we're gonna follow up and get the necessary documentation that supports that gift agreement. The exception to this is pledges, and when we have a donor making a pledge commitment, we will sometimes do put it right in the gift agreement. Donor is pledging twenty thousand dollars a year for five years um, to us, and when we get that signed gift agreement, we will book that gift. So what is documentation, gift documentation? Well, number one, at the University of Illinois, it may be a, a fund agreement. And when I say fund agreement, a fund agreement is something we use to establish a new fund here, meaning we don't have an existing bucket, if you will, to put that gift in. It's got enough unique terms and criteria and expectations around it that it needs to be held in its own separate bucket to be accounted for and managed. So. Example, if I set up a scholarship in our College of Agriculture and I want it to be for students in crop sciences that have um, that are from underrepresented um, counties, so to speak, in Illinois, I'm probably going to need a fund agreement. We're probably going to set up a fund agreement so that that gift can be administered separately. Uh, a note to yourself, our minimum for that is $25,000 to um, have a separate um, we identified fund. That's important for your institution to decide what is the appropriate minimum funding level that you will require to set up a new fund for tracking purposes. Because the last thing you want to do is be setting up funds for every every possible gift to your organization. If if somebody's giving you a thousand dollars and they want it to be for scholarships, you want a general fund that you can you can direct it to, which is a good segue to number two, a statement of gift. This is the second type of gift documentation we use. If, if somebody says, I want to give $25,000 to scholarships at the University of Illinois, um, there might be an existing fund. They don't, they don't need their name on it. They, don't, they, they want to support, support a broad purpose in that college. Instead of creating a whole separate fund and going through a four-page, five-page fund agreement to outline all the uses, it may be we can do a one page statement of gift and that statement of gift is very simple. It's, you know, I, Meg Klein, um, have 
and making a gift of $25,000. I'm directing it to the University of Illinois Foundation for the ACES Scholarship Fund. And, you know, I might have a little statement of donor intent. Why is this important to me? Um, I sign it, it goes, and that shows that I am making the gift to that fund. It generally has a statement on there that says I'm giving to it in accordance with the terms of that pot of that fund's governing document as it stands now or as it may be amended in the future. So it's very, um, it's very simple, it's very easy. And for some organizations, particularly if you're um, working for an organization um, that has um, a, a general broad cause, you may be able to be doing a lot of statement of gifts. So if, if you're an organization that generally funnels most of your funds to an unrestricted account, you might want to have a statement of gift just for major gift gifts being made. So there's a, a question here. Do you, do, do you use a statement of gift for each major gift? Not necessarily, but we like to. I mean, if, a don if I'm sitting down with a donor and they say I'm going to give even $10,000 sometimes to a, an existing fund, sometimes I think it's good to get on record that donor signing off that they, they've made this commitment to this fund. It's kind of like our letter of direction to our, our gift processing staff and for our record that they're giving to it and that they're recognizing they're giving to a general fund that's going to be spent in this way that, that may be amended over, over time. So again, not necessarily a requirement, but best practice would say, I mean, if somebody sends $10,000 over the transom and nobody had a conversation with them, it's probably coming in and we're not gonna have necessarily any documentation. But if somebody had a direct conversation with the, the individual donor, we're gonna try to capture at least a statement of gift to outline the intention and the history of that. Um, and is the statement of gift a part of the donor agreement? That's a really um, that's a really great great question. Yes, the statement of gift is either a one-page standalone form that we do if we don't have to do a fund agreement. But if we are establishing a new fund, we will do a fund agreement, and we will have a section that states this is the um, this is the statement of gift right up front. So the same things that are in a statement of gift are. Um, in the fund agreement as article one for us. Let me keep uh, plugging along here and I'll get to some of these other uh, questions here. Uh, will or trust? Um, sometimes the, the, the governing document is not our fund agreement or not a statement of gift. Sometimes it's the will or trust. We have some donors that one, maybe we never knew we were in the will or trust. And so we find out about the gift after they're deceased and we are beholden to whatever the terms were in that will or trust. And that becomes the governing document for that gift. Or sometimes I've had donors where we've said, hey, let's do a gift agreement. I think our preference is usually to do a gift agreement for a large gift and have our terms and have the estate language say, I leave my gift to the University of Illinois Foundation for the benefit of the Meg Klein Fund. That would be our preference, and then we can always amend the fund agreement on the side. But in some cases, donors say, no, I want it all in my estate documents. So sometimes we will give all the language in our gift agreements. They'll take it to their attorneys, and they'll put it all in the will or the trust document. So again, you can't always assume that it's going to be a fund agreement. It's not always that neat and tidy. So, so what is gift documentation? As I mentioned, it is based upon, oftentimes, there are federal laws, but it's often driven state by state. So in Illinois, um, we follow the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, and essentially it's a record of mutually agreed upon terms between the foundation, the University of Illinois Foundation, or the charity um, that's receiving the gift, and the donor who is making the gift. It's, it's that simple. And again, there's probably a lot more to this. And again, this is where I say, I am not an attorney, but your the attorneys in your organization or your outside legal counsel um, will be your best friend in these uh, situations because you want to make sure that if you're looking at your gift agreements, that they're looking them over and making sure that they capture all the key elements. So, so what should be in a, a gift agreement? And again, I've got lots of questions about parameters and proposals that I will 
we'll ask um, and a statement, a template for our statement of gift. I can, I can get that to people. Um, but bottom line is your gift agreement should state what is the donor's intention in making the gift? So right up front, you might want to have a recital to say, I, Meg Klein, am making this gift because I want to make education more affordable to students throughout the state of Illinois or throughout the country, whatever those parameters may be. Um, a good gift agreement or gift documentation spells out what are the fund administration terms, um, i.e., we get a lot of questions like, what are your fees? What are your fees? Um, we don't put our fees in our gift agreements because we know that endowment fees over time change. Um, and so we don't wanna have to be beholden to a, a set of circumstances that are going to change possibly on a periodic basis. So we will make reference to in accordance with foundation and university policies and procedures. And most donors are comfortable with that. We, we disclose what they are currently. We tell what our history has been in those spaces. If, if they change, we are transparent about those fees to donors um, so that they know. Um, but most donors will come, come forward and be fine with that. But same thing with naming. If they say, I want to name um, something with this gift we will often say in accordance with university policy and procedure, particularly if it's something in the future, um, because we don't know what the current policy and procedure might be to put your name on a building or on a college or even on a program. So we make that reference to be broad and general. The third thing you will find is the gift agreement should define what is the fund structure that you want to have in place. So for example, is this donor giving this gift so that it can be held as an endowment or is it going to be a current use fund um, where you spend it immediately or is it maybe a quasi endowment? Maybe your organization is gonna treat it like an endowment but they might invade principal um, at some point in time if they need to for some, some purpose or, or reason. Um, I mentioned it, it might record a specific gift. It does, it always records the purpose of the gift. How are we supposed to use it? What are our limitations? And then what are the tools that are in place to monitor the use of the funds? So if we go forward here, let me. So how do we document donor intent? Um, again, this is an Illinois statute. I'm sure your state, if you look up, what um, if your state has a charitable trust act, it will tell you what those are, but it basically spells out um, donor intent is to utilize the trust or the gift in conformity with its purposes for the benefit, best interest of the beneficiaries or to fulfill the general intent of the donor of the trust as expressed in the governing instrument of the trust. So donor intent and in gift doc documents is often expressed as number one, what are we required to do? And what are the donor's preferences that we do? And that's kind of an important distinction. Um, I think be very cautious with this because I think sometimes preferences can be interpreted as absolutes. Um, but I think it's important to distinguish the two of those. We can state a donor prefers, okay, for example, farmland. We accept a gift of farmland. They may prefer we hold it in perpetuity. Um, we are probably not going to agree to that term. We may say we will hold it for X number of years, but it's okay to say, hey, that's their preference. We're, we're saying the intent, but we have our out that if for some reason we can't hold that farmland long term, um, there's a, a minimum there. So we mentioned, I'm mean, in light of time, I'm going to skip through this. Let's talk about Aspects of fund administration, and I talked about all of this. What is in the fund administration section of gift agreements? I would encourage you to, to reference you know, spending rates. So for example, our current endowment pays out 4% of a six year moving average. That formula changes from time to time. It does not change often, but our independent board of directors has changed our spending rate on the endowment from time to time. And so we don't wanna have our document saying, 4% of a six year moving average. No, we wanna say the 
that the foundation will set a spending rate in accordance with foundation policies and procedures, or as established by the UIF Foundation Board of Directors. I mentioned this with expenses. Decision makers, who make de decisions on expenditure of funds? Those are things that we put in policy. So if in a unit, um, it's, you know, the spending authority generally rests with the department head or the dean to do that. We're not going to say, we're not going to name a person by name who's going to actually make the spending decisions. We're going to reference it by policy. Um, amendment provisions, who agrees to the amendment? Um, bottom line is we don't, we don't love to amend gift agreements, but we know sometimes that is the case. It's got to be a two-way street. You know, we, we basically say to donors that if we have to amend this agreement, it has to be mutually agreed upon. You can't just amend the terms and expect us to live with that. It's, it's got to be a two-way street. Um, and again, we usually say something about governing law. We usually say state here, state of Illinois will be the... Um, the situs for the, the law and then... Um, future circumstances, you know, what, what happens if in fact you give to XYZ program and that pro program no longer exists? We will give donors an opportunity to suggest, um, to suggest alternative uses, but in the event they don't name something, we have our independent board of directors, we have a process with them for reviewing alternative uses or future circumstances in the future. And, and going back, it's always a good idea when drafting gift agreements to have, you know, the person in the future, the dean of 2166 and LAS, you know, who we're, we're drafting these gift agreements for the long term. So we may not put every minute specific detail in that fund agreement. It may be very broad on paper, but we're going to steward it and try to align with our documentation and notes a more specific intent, but it's not going to be in the gift agreement. I mentioned fund structure. So this is just an example of the different funds and, you know, current use. We, the money comes in, it goes right back out. Our, what a quasi endowment is and a permanent endowment is. And I'm going to um, skip the records, the purpose, because we, we talked about all of these. But all of that is to say that no gift to agreement in the world is going to solve your problems if you don't start with a good gift, okay? And I, I mean, again, gift agreements cannot start or cannot fix a bad gift to begin with. And I think we all probably can nod our heads and speak to some, some bad gifts that we've had um, over time. So, so keep in mind, you don't have to accept all gifts. In fact, there are times that you should probably walk away from a gift. Um, prime example, more complex gifts like um, real estate um, require, you know, a thorough, ex thorough review and acceptance from your gift acceptance committee um, and whether or not you want to accept that gift or the terms that it's being given with. Um, but even with cash gifts, you may not want to accept that gift, particularly if a donor has unrealistic expectations about that gift and what you want to, they want to, what they want to accomplish. Um, and again, finally, you know, you got to consider best practices and the legal framework for accepting a gift and the terms of that gift. So here are some things that I've seen in my career that have been problematic. Number one. I've had donors give gifts and saying, well, can I sit in on the selection committee for selecting the recipient of this, this scholarship or this award? Our answer is always a very strong no. Um, you can pull up uh, uh, IRS pub publication 526 and show them specifically that by choosing the recipient, they are it's no longer a gift. They're disqualifying it for the charitable deduction. Um, Restricting it to a use outside the organization. We've, we will work with donors um, sometimes in receiving a gift through a trust where part of the remainder goes to an organization outside of the University of Illinois Foundation. But if somebody wants to give us a gift and it is going to support the 
the local food bank, we are not going to accept that gift and do all the administration uh, for that. Um, we get we get this a lot with fraternities and sororities on campus. They want us to hold a gift to do to do things for that sorority or fraternity that we cannot do because that's they've got a that doesn't align with our charter and our charge. Um, be careful about narrow restrictions. I think if you look at really old, old agreements that have, were crafted back in the day, sometimes you'll find terms that are so narrow, you know, they've got pro they've got problematic terms. So for example, I want somebody with, with blue eyes and brown hair from Stark County, Illinois, that is majoring in underwater basket weaving. Okay. Can your organization even find the students who can check all those boxes? Um, is that really philanthropy? And then finally, um, and this has kind of been a hot topic, certainly with protected classes and what universities can and cannot do, but you have to be sure that you're accepting gifts that, and the language is such that you are complying with your federal and state laws. And again, that could be a whole session into itself, um, and we can talk more about that. So to just recap this, good gift terms are broad and flexible, include few, if any, selection criteria, and defer to organizations, policies, procedures, and practices. So one last thing before we get to our, our poll, and so I'm, I'm teeing you up, Jen, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna jump to this so we have time for questions. Um, don't put thoughts in donors' minds. I, I've seen this before where donors have said, I wanna do a scholarship at the University of Illinois, and that's all they wanna do. Don't go down that rabbit hole to say, well, do you want it to be in this field or that field? Do you want this? Do you want this? You start asking questions that start to pigeonhole the gift into a much more narrow scope than what you envision. So sometimes the best thing you can do is make the ask, they say yes, listen to what they say, but don't necessarily put suggestions in their mind. Um, I also think it's important for donors to understand sometimes the most impactful gift they can give is an unrestricted gift that allows leadership to make investments that are key and strategic to the organization. And having some of those examples of unrestricted gifts that have really had transformational impact can be key. Um, be prepared to kind of argue the points or discuss the points when things are too restrictive. Um, future reporting and communication, I think it's important that goes in the stewardship plan. Again, we will put a section when donors ask about reporting that says that the unit, the benefiting unit will, will make periodic updates at least annually in accordance with, with what's agreed between the donor and the benefiting unit. Um, and then, of course, we always try to manage the expectations. So here is our case study. And I think we have time for this, Jen, really quickly, because we'll, we'll go through this quickly. Case study, Susie Smith, proud of her university education, forever indebted to the university for the outstanding education she received as a first-generation college student. She wants to ensure others like her get that same experience. But during a visit with the charming development officer from the university, Susie is delighted that the officer asks her to fund a scholarship with an endowed gift of $100,000. She eagerly accepts, but she has a few conditions. And here are our conditions. There were nine of them. This was not all one donor. Susie's multiple donors, but I think half of them were one donor, I will tell you in real life. Uh, and so Jen, these are all things that the donor asked for in the gift agreement, all nine of these, we're gonna do a poll and I'm curious from the audience's perspective, would you say yes to them? Would you say no to them? Or is it a maybe? So I'm gonna give you like two minutes, three minutes to quick, quickly go through this. So Jen, can you share the poll? Yep, I will launch it here in one second. You guys should see it on your screen. Uh, the question is, would you accept Susie's gift if? So we have all nine of the boxes you see on Meg's um, PowerPoint laid out. Each has a question, um, yes, no, or maybe. To see all of them, you're gonna wanna scroll down on the poll itself or expand it if you can make it bigger. So we have scholarships must go to the first generation college students. 
maybe yes no maybe scholarships must go to students from middle of nowhere city high school the scholarships must go to students who plan to study in Susie's same field of study and who plan to teach after graduation Susie expects the student recipients to receive exactly four thousand dollars each year Students may renew their scholarships if they maintain at least a 3.5 GPA on a 4.0 scale. Susie wants the scholarship committee chaired by the Dean to review all of the applications for which she has written an application and requires an essay. And annually, Susie requires a personal essay from the student recipients outlining how the scholarship has impacted their education. She requires them to join her for an annual pizza party that she hosts on campus with the college administrators. And then finally, what if Susie wants each May um, to have the chancellor to travel to her high school to present the scholarship award to the incoming freshman that receives the award? So these are all the different stipulations. Like Meg said, not all of them. She didn't ask for all of them, but if she asked for one of them, would, would you accept the gift? Yes, no, maybe, maybe you'd have to do some investigation. So um, Jen, so I'm, just... gonna, I'm gonna start answering what we did while they're, while they're doing their poll. I don't know if you're seeing the polls coming in or if people- Yeah, we've got about 63% of the people that have answered so far and they're still Good. answering. Good, keep answering. Cause I think we'll, we will show the, the results but I will tell you at least what we did in each of these cases quickly. Number one, we said yes to. We, we feel like there are enough first-generation college students that we will say preference for first-generation college students. It's something we do ask on applications and it's something we can identify. So yes, we, we have said yes to that. Scholarships must go to students from middle of nowhere high school. This is one where we will say preference for, however, it's one where we require an alternative use. If I grew up in a very small town in, in Northwest Illinois, I will tell you, um, if we get one student out of that high school every year, we're doing well. So we would say in that case, what we do is we go to our financial aid office, our admissions office and say, tell us how many kids have come for the last five years from that high school. They send those results and then we are able to tell the donor, hey, it's great you wanna support somebody from this high school, but could you make it broader? Maybe you could say, it could be from any of these surrounding counties, or maybe it's it's so general as to say from a low sending county. Um, and so we're getting at their point and objective, but we've got a, an out if we get locked in. Um, so yes, hey, we're 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 on target here with these polls here. I should I should share the poll over here. So yes, most we're in agreement. Number two. Scholarships must go to students from middle of nowhere high school. No, we, we would be in the maybe category. Scholarships must go to students who plan to study in her same field of study and who plan to teach after graduation. We would say no to this. And here is why we would say no. We would, we would say yes to a field of study or preference for a field of study, but we cannot force people to go teach after they graduate. As much as we know we have a shortage of teachers and would love to have more people going to out to teach, no, we, we would not say that. We could say that we hope they will, but you know, we probably would choose our words a little more carefully there to say you know, the donor's intent is to, to do this, but we can't force it. We can't assure the donor a guarantee that they will go teach. Uh, students expect the student recipients to receive exactly $4,000 each year. We would not accept that term. And the reason I say that is circumstances change. Uh, prime example, we've got, some, we've got an old fund agreement, a scholarship I got as an undergrad here. It says $500 exactly is what the student gets. $500 today for education doesn't go very far. I think we all know that. So we would we would choose different language to say, you know, it's the donor's intent that the scholarships be, be larger and more meaningful rather than smaller in nature. So we would be we would be very cautious about not putting a specific dollar amount in the fund agreement. Students may renew their scholarship if they maintain at least a 3.5 GPA on a 4.0 scale. We would not state that in a fund agreement. 
we would not want to point piggyback or pigeonhole ourselves into a criteria that may not be realistic. Um, for example, when I was an undergrad, it was a 5.0 scale. So again, we can always adjust and interpret, but what we try to do is say scholarships, students may renew their scholarships if they remain a student in good standing or are, you know, this scholarship should be students of merit and we let the dean define and the unit define what is a meritorious student because a meritorious student in engineering may look totally different than a, um, a student in another complete discipline that maybe has a less rigorous you know, curriculum. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, she wishes for the scholarship committee chaired by the Dean to review the applications for which she has written an application and requires an essay. Uh, no, we would not, we would not do that. We, we have, we do not want the donor setting the terms of how scholarships are awarded. I don't know too many deans who sit down and um, select scholarship recipients any longer. It's usually a committee or it's an automated process with um, a scholarship committee at the college, a college level. We have um, recognized that the way we administer scholarships is very different today than what it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, annually requires a personal essay from the student recipients. We would love to say yes to this and we will encourage it, but we will not write it into a fund agreement. We cannot force students to write thank you notes, much to my dismay. Um, when I was in the College of Aces, we would bring them in and feed them pizza and have them sign thank you notes. And that was how we got our, our thank you notes done for impact. But again, we cannot guarantee this. So we would say no to this if that was a deal breaker. Um, requires them to join her for an annual pizza party she hosts. This is one that was never written into a fund agreement, but this is a donor who star started many, many years ago hosting an annual pizza party for all of his scholarship recipients. And it became part of the culture of, of things. And it's interesting, it was something I inherited in a unit and it was a great thing, but over time it was harder and harder to get all the students to come and give up a Saturday night to do these things. And it, it was interesting. It kind of created um, a donor relations issue for us because even though it wasn't written into the, the code and there were other things we were doing to steward the gift, the fact of the matter is you can't force students to necessarily show up at these things as a contingency for receiving the gift. And so, again, I hate to be negative, Nellie, but just be very cautious of the unintended consequences of of stewardship actions that may become expectations. And this last one, you know, expects the chancellor to travel to the high school to present the scholarship award. Yes, this has happened at the University of Illinois. And we, um, I think a lot depends on your organization. Um, what I would suggest here, we would never write that into a fund agreement. We would just work with the donor to say, hey, we will work with you to send a representative or figure out a way to, to do this. So again, I, I hope that gives you a flavor um, for the types of things you may be asked to do. I know we are getting short on time, so I will just say, remember when you're talking with donors, start with the big picture, focus on the impact and frame the gift agreement in ways that help the organization achieve the donor's desired impact. And I think through conversations, most donors eventually come around to their that way of thinking um, when you explain why you're not willing to put something specifically in a gift agreement. So this just re, um, recites those details. And I did put this in here as, as a suggestion, you know, in gift agreements, I would suggest, um, you know, if you if you have provisions, you start with a declaration of the donor's intent, who they are, why they're establishing this, what is the gift they're giving, um, what kind of fund is it? Is it quasi? Is it endowment? Is it current use? How is the what's the purpose of the fund? How is it supposed to be used? You might say, how does the donor expect to be recognized for the gift? That may be a very general statement. And then last but not least, you know, all the nitty gritty legal terms put in that article four. I will tell you in our agreements, article four is our nitty gritty 
um, details by policy. That's the area that we don't change. I mean, and we, and we kind of make that clear to donors. It's like, this is what we need in here by Illinois state law so we can effectively administer um, your gift. So with that, I know, Jen, I'm close on time, but I'm looking at the questions and I don't know if you want to yeah. jump on or, or kind of prioritize some of these questions sure. in our time. Yep. I'll go ahead and ask you one. And then Nathan, you can tee up the next one. I'd um, say Jen, just go straight through them since we're a little short on time. Okay. Uh, what would you do if a complex gift that they did not want is left in an estate the donor has passed away and they can't explain why there is an issue with it. Do you tell the estate attorney that they don't want it? What do you do about that? We will we will generally ask, you know, certainly if, if we knew they were considering this ahead of time, we would encourage the attorney to write the language to say either the get the asset or the net proceeds from the liquidation of the asset. Hopefully the executor or the trustee in that case might be willing to liquidate the asset. Um, and just give us the net proceeds. That would be our preference. Do you have time limits for naming and how is that received by donors? We, we do. We generally will say on capital projects, um, 25 years are the useful life of the building. Um, and most donors understand that. And we kind of explain that by saying, look, we wanna make sure this looks good. So people will give gifts for buildings. We now ask for maintenance endowments so that we have funds to maintain them but we will give ourselves an out for the useful life of the building. Because like I said, do you really want your name on something that might look dilapidated in 25 years when you're gone? Most come it, around to that. <laughs> in the gift agreement, do you include how the donor will be recognized? For example, on a donor wall or a name on a, on a building or a room, et cetera? It depends. I mean, if it's for the naming of a college, if it's a naming for a building, that's a little more concrete that we put the terms in. But if it is something in the future um, or, or naming, let's say it's a professorship or chair, we'll say that, you know, the donor will be recognized in accordance with university policy and procedure in recognizing the donor, they shall use the name of Jane S. Doe. So if it's the Jane S. Doe professorship chair, we try to get the name that should be used, but we are pretty silent on those things. Wonderful. Particularly if it's really down in the future. I mean, if it's a gift now, it's a little easier to negotiate those terms than something that might be 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Meg. We are out of time. I want to let people know um, if you have questions, we had a lot of questions left over we didn't get to. Meg has offered um, her email address is on the screen, mkline at uif.uif uillinois.edu. Um, you will get the slides. So if you don't, can't jot that down right now, I'm, you will get the slides. So you'll have it. Uh, you can also reach out to Nathan or myself and you can visit us at stelter.com to learn more about Stelter. And like I said, at the beginning of the webinar, we recorded it. Um, so you will get the recording and we will share a PDF of the slides. That was another question. We did go through quite quickly through some of the slides, but you'll get a, you'll get the PDF handout of all of the slides so you can um, look at those further. Uh, look for me, an email from me tomorrow that will give you a link to access both of those things. And with that said, Meg, I just want to say thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. Thank you for having us. And again, apologies, I didn't get to all the questions, but send me a note directly. I'm happy to follow up with you and answer whatever questions people may have. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Meg. And thanks, Nathan, for being here with us. Yes, thanks, Meg. That was terrific. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And be sure to check out, uh, look for the next webinar, which is coming soon, October 16th. It's the panel discussion that Nathan talked about for experts in the field. So I'll be sending you an invite soon. Uh, be sure to look for that and get signed up and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.